think that you can do that this side of glory, you are sadly mistaken. But there is a change. There is a change. As a Christian, you are no longer your own. You have been bought by Christ and possessed by His Spirit. We're going to look at that later on. Not being our own. You are not your own. If you are a follower of Christ, you no longer belong to yourself. You belong only to Christ. And you serve Him as Lord. He can't just be your Savior. He has to also be your Lord. So what are the evidences of the Spirit's presence in your life? The New Testament teaches three, types, uh, three kinds of evidence, and all of them are mentioned here in Galatians. The first is mentioned in verse 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? One evidence that the Galatians could point to was the miracles that God was doing by the Spirit in their midst. And I think this was very miraculous signs like Jesus did. In other words, mighty works like healings, exorcisms, significantly altering of circumstances through prayer. God worked. These gave evidence to the Galatians believers that the Spirit has poured into their lives. But Paul is aware that physical miracles in themselves do not justify or verify the work of God's Spirit. Since in 2 Thessalonians 2.9 we see that Satan can also produce powerful signs. So this in of itself is not enough. Not alone. But God working miracles in their life was a sign. That was a sign that he pointed to. How does the Spirit, how does this happen? Does that happen through works of the law? No. Through the Spirit. So another one we can consider is the evidence that the Spirit is a Christian life, namely the deep assurance that God is our Father and we are his children. This assurance is hard. This assurance is hard. Many Christians walk through life not assured of their salvation. It's a little bit different. Assured that God is our Father and we are His children. If that's the case, for sure we're saved. For sure we're saved. Galatians 4, 6 says, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Dad, Daddy, basically in our, our terminology. When your heart is enabled to cry out sincerely to God as your loving Father, it is evidence that the spirit of sonship is in you. We don't have, the problem is we're thinking of confidence. We have confidence that he is my, he is my dad. He is my God. That should be a confidence that is in us. Who do you turn to when you're faced with hard times and trials? So the second evidence of the Spirit presence is the assurance we feel that God is our Father. And we are heirs with Christ of glory. But even assurance can be deceitful. Jesus tells us about people who felt they were His disciples, but they turned away. And look at Judas. Look what he did. So the third evidence of the Spirit's presence should be added, namely, a genuine love, a genuine impulse of love. And I mean real love. Not the not just mushy gushy godly love. Agape love. Galatians 5:22 says the fruit of the spirit, one of the fruits, love. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. All these things we're going to look at later on. The bottom line of testing the spirit uh, uh, testing the spirit is test of love. How did Jesus say that we, the world would know us? By our love for one another. By our love for one another. How's our love? Sometimes not so good. For most of us here, there's a combination of these that are evidence to us. Some are stronger, some are weaker. But it's a combination of these that give us assurance that we have received the Spirit. Well, how is the Spirit received anyway? The third question raised in verse 2, raised in answer, is how is the 
How do we receive the Spirit? He said, do you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Duh. What's the answer? Works of the law. No, just kidding. See if you're paying attention. Answer, by hearing with faith. Paul asked them to remember back when he was preaching in their synagogues and in their streets. That he reasoned with them from the Old Testament that Jesus was a Christ. And arguing that all people are sinners. All people deserve hell. That Jesus died for the sins and rose again. That any who trust in him can have forgiveness and hope. And as they were hearing the message, what happened? Faith happened. God implanted faith. They didn't plan it. You didn't plan it. Did you? When you heard it and it made sense, did you plan it? Did you force it? No. It came up on you like a dawn comes up on a darkened city. It came, as Jesus says, like the wind. The Spirit comes like a wind. Not knowing where it came from. Not knowing where it goes. But does its own. That's how the Spirit moves. And you felt yourself crying out in your heart, Abba, Father, Jesus is Lord. You did no worse. You were worked upon. You did no works. Who worked on you? God worked on you. God did it. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting away all your defenses, laying bare your need and God's provision. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ drove out the darkness of unbelief. You found yourself as helpless as a little child, yet utterly secure in the love of Jesus. He had come to you in his word. The word had proclaimed the faith, and the old, uh, the old self of rebellion died. The Spirit of Christ took up residence in your heart. The Galatians, they did not burn the Spirit. They did not work for the Spirit. They did not work for God. They received the Spirit when God did the work for them. You received the Spirit when God did the work for you. For apart from His working in your life, you at this very moment would be lost in your sins. So verse 2 is the first step of showing the Galatians why their actions contradicted the work of the Spirit in their life. Paul reminded them how they began the Christian life. Then in step 2, Paul tells them in verse 3 how they have to keep going in the same way. How did they begin? Did they begin by works or spirit? That was clear to them. They understood. He says, then why if you began with the spirit, are you trying to finish or do with works? Oh foolish Galatians. It is clear it cannot be done. If you try it, you will make shipwreck of your Christian life. So we need to be very clear about what the Galatians were about to do here so we can avoid it like the plague. Spirit or the flesh. Notice the change of terminology between verse 2 and verse 3. Verse 2. The contrast between the works of the law and hearing by faith. How did you come? Or how are miracles done by works of the law and hearing by faith? In contrast with being by the Spirit and trying to be completed by the flesh. We have talked about the spirit, but now what about the flesh? Is it just this skin on my body? Is it just this meat on my bones? Is that the only thing? Is that what he's talking about? Just my physical body? Oh, it's much deeper than that. <clears throat> it's not just physical. It is the old eye, which cherishes independence and self-assertion. My daughter, who I love to death, is full of independence and self-assertion. She was sitting on my lap this morning and she wanted to play on the computer. I tell CJ that's 
the old man leaving. <laughs> Just kidding. The old eye. The flesh. It's my way. I want to do it my way. I don't need nobody telling me what to do. That's the flesh. Romans 8, 7 says, The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Flesh is the autonomous self. So in love with its personal power of self-determination that it does not and cannot submit to God's absolute authority. But don't always think that flesh always looks like it, wicked. Oh, there's two different kinds of flesh that pops up at least. There's the sinful flesh we're familiar with. The irreligious flesh that flaunts its insubordination to God and immorality and idolatry. It's a kind of, a second kind of flesh. Maybe it is more pointing to us. It's that religious form of flesh. And it is much more dangerous. It is subtle. Its subtle insubordination and self-determination can manifest itself in a philosophy. Okay. The religious form is much more dangerous. It is subtle insubordination and self-determination can manifest itself with a philosophy of Christian growth which encourages people who begin with faith to grow with works. That's how you do it. I mean, that gospel thing is fine, but you know what? Now you got to do it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and just trudge on. You can do it. You can do it. Raw, raw, raw. That's what a lot of pastors are. All they are is a cheerleader. That stands up here once a week trying to encourage you to hit it down again one more time. A coach saying, you can do it. You cannot do it. You are a miserable failure by yourself. Sorry. Sorry. Didn't mean to offend anyone. But all y'all suck. So do I. All y'all are terrible. We're horrible. We're evil. We're sinners. We cannot do it on our own. Even our own works, our own goodness is to the glory of God. He's the one that gave it to us. Consider verse 3 very carefully. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? It is not directed to those who are yet to start a Christian life. It is written to those who have begun some time ago and are far along in their walk. And now are in grave danger of trying to live their Christian life in a way that nullifies the grace of God and leads to destruction. The point of this verse is that you must go on in Christian life the same way you started it. Since we began by the work of the Spirit, how do we continue? By the work of the Spirit. The essence of the Galatian heresy is this. You begin your Christian life by faith, and then you grow in your Christian life by works. I mean, God gets you the ball going, but then you're with the broom, getting it. Do you ever, ever see that Olympic sport where those people are sweeping on ice? I don't know. And this ball or this big boulder's going out there, just as hard as they can to get that. It's a very odd sport. I'm not sure who invented it. I don't know how that came about. You know, someone dropped a pan and they just thought, hey, let's sweep. I don't know. It seems a little weird to me. But that's sort of what the idea is. You get a big boulder rolling, God gets it pushing. But you've got to sweep to keep it going and you've got to do it. And if you don't do it, that boulder's going to stop before it gets to the end. Oh, my goodness. That is the Galatian heresy. Yeah, God did it. Now I have to take it up from now on. That is, by drawing on the powers in yourself, you make a contribution to your salvation. Our modern form of this heresy is, God helps those who help themselves. I'm not saying that if you need a job and you sit at home and wait for the phone to ring, a miraculously a job's going to fall in your lap. No. But that means a little bit different than that. If you're buying into this as a way of 